Genesis 24 is our text this morning. We are finishing up our series on marriage and family. We have spent the entire um, summer, basically all of July, since July on, looking at marriage and family. We're closing this week. Last week, Jason did a phenomenal job on speaking um, to those of you guys who are single and your purpose and your calling while you are single. There's some things that he said that I think is vital for you guys to understand whether you're single or married um, in the context of the city that we live in, of how we are called to live our lives for God's glory. The reality is most of you guys will get married, most of you guys that are single. So I wanted to spend one more week looking at singles and what the Bible teaches about being single. This is an important topic. It's something that most of us have wrestled with in our lives. If you think about it, apart from the decision to follow Jesus, there is no greater decision that you will ever make in your life other than who you will marry. It's the most important decision you'll ever make other than following Jesus. So nothing is bigger than that decision. You're going to spend the rest of your life with him or her. So you better make the right decision. The question of marriage is really two questions. One, the first question is, should I get married? If you believe you're supposed to get married, the second question is, who am I supposed to marry? And there are good arguments in the Bible of whether you should get married or not get married. There might be some of you in this room that God is calling you to a life of singleness. Praise God. Understand that if God is calling you to a life of singleness, you are called to live your life for God's glory. To live your life. You guys who are single, you have more opportunities to do more things for God than most of us who are married. You have less doors, less loopholes, less spouses, less children to answer to, and you're able to do greater things for God. However, the reality is most people in this room will eventually get married. So, you have to con so you've already considered the first question, will, should I get married? But there is also two fears that you face in that question. The first fear is somehow being passed over. That's the fear of those who you, you really want to get married or you dream about getting married, but you fear that you're, you're too young or too old or not attractive enough or you don't have the right personality or you don't have the right career or the right education and you think that no one will ever marry you. There's also the second fear. There's the fear of making the wrong choice. What if I marry the wrong person? And the second fear is well-founded, isn't it? I've heard someone say it's better to be single than to wish you were single. So this morning, my purpose is not to tell you to get married. That's your parents' job. Um, I don't think God says that you have to get married. The Bible doesn't say that at all. However, there's at least a few truths about marriage that you need to think about. The first one is that marriage is God's number one way of alleviating human loneliness. Genesis 2, God said it's not good for man to be alone. God meant for us to be in community. That's why we have the church. But there's also a community in terms of marriage. You need other people, and they need you. Marriage is God's number one way of alleviating loneliness in your life. The second truth is most people will get married. The stats bear that out. For all that we hear about singleness and all that we hear about cohabitation and all that we hear about um, same-sex marriages, the reality is more people get married today than ever before. The third reason is some people enjoy getting married so much that they do it two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. They do it so much. Divorce, remarriage is a huge issue in our culture, in our society today. So this topic is very important. One of my favorite conversations having with people is when they come to me and they, want to, they say that I want to do things biblically. I want to get married biblically. I want to date biblically. I just want to do it the way the Bible teaches. And I love that statement because it sounds so biblical and it sounds so spiritual, but the reality is they have no idea what the Bible teaches about how to do it biblically. Think about it. Think about the ways that men and women got married in the Bible. There's the group of Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy who they take an attractive prisoner of war, they bring her home, they shave her head, they trim her nails, they get her new clothes, and then they marry her. Is that the biblical definition of marriage that you want? There's the biblical story of God telling a man to go to the streets and find a prostitute that loves to sleep around and marry her. Oh yeah, by the way, while you're still married to her, she'll still sleep around and leave you numerous times, but you're still commanded to love her. Is that the biblical definition of marriage that you want? There's Moses who gets kicked out of Egypt, and he meets seven women that are by the well trying to feed their um, livestock, and they're getting attacked by men, and he rescues them and marries one of their daughters. Is that the type of marriage that you want? Then there's a the story of Boaz. He buys a piece of property, um, and along with the property, he gets a woman and marries her. 
They're the Benjaminites. They go to a party, they hide. They can't go into the party and hang out, they hide outside of the party. The women come, they start dancing, and these men go and grab a woman. Whoever they grab, they end up marrying. This is a biblical definition of marriage for nerds who can't get invited to parties. There's Adam. He takes a nap, wakes up, and there's a pain in his side. He's in pain. He realizes that a part of his body is gone, and he looks, and a woman is walking down the aisle toward him. That kind of marriage is going to cost you a rip. It's probably a lot cheaper than what most weddings cost today. There's the guy who's in love with the woman and he agrees to work with his father-in-law for seven years uh, for his daughter. He does his time, does the hard work. Marriage day comes and he's too busy planning the wedding that doesn't realize that it's not the wife that he wants. It's his, the wife's sister. And then he marries the wrong person. Then he works another seven years for the woman that he actually wants to marry. Then there's Cain. We have no idea how he found a wife, but the Bible says that he ends up getting married and has kids. No idea. Probably his sister. He marries his sister. There's a guy who becomes an emperor and does a, holds a beauty contest and picks the best wife out there. There's a guy who is the most powerful judge. He meets a woman one day, runs home to his mom and says, that's the girl I want to marry. Go and get her for me. That's the biblical definition. Now, some of that works for you guys. Um, there's the guy who actually kills the woman's husband, then marries her, and then tries to cover the whole thing up. And then there's the guy who says, why be picky at all? Just marry them all. And so he marries 700 of them. And then he has 300 mistresses. Is that the biblical definition of marriage that you want? See, there's the guy that goes on a rant about you shouldn't get married at all, but instead spend the rest of your life being single. And in fact, while you do that, why don't you go ahead and go, go to prison, get beaten, shipwrecked, and eventually get martyred for your life. So when you say, I want the biblical definition of dating or marriage or relationships, there isn't one. There isn't a specific way that God works. For some of you, you will meet someone, maybe it's in college, maybe it's in church, maybe it's um, somewhere, you'll meet someone and you'll know that's the person. Some of you, it'll happen through your parents, your parents are involved, your friends are involved, your family's involved. Others of you, um, it might be a co-worker. You never know how God is going to work. But the reality is God works through different circumstances, different situations. There's one couple in this room that blames me for the two of them getting together and getting married. I'm so confused of why they blame me instead of giving me credit, even though they're happily married. But they blame me for the two of them getting married. Our text this morning is a story of Isaac and Rebecca. It's a story not about how Isaac finds Rebecca, but it's a story of how God orchestrates the details of the lives of these two individuals to bring them together. Genesis 24 is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. It's the first great romantic story in the Bible. It's a wonderful story. It's a charming story all by itself. And from it, we're going to learn some biblical principles of how God is working in your life. We come to the Genesis 24. I would like to um, help, I think this text will help us in two areas. First of all, I think this passage is very helpful advice for those of you who are unmarried and considering getting married one day. Second, this passage reveals some biblical principles of God's guidance that applies to all of life, whether you're married or not married, whether the topic is marriage or anything, whether it's about what your career choice is, what your future is. There's some things in here that applies to all of life, so apply to it. And in order to understand this passage, you got to go back way back in history, back 3,800 years, back across all the way to a land called Mesopotamia. you got to go back to a land that is strange and completely unusual that we can't even imagine it. And what, yet when you read the story of Genesis 24, the story has a very familiar ring. It begins with a father and his unmarried son. The father is concerned about the son carrying on the family name. So he hatches a plan that leads to a servant praying. It happens at a chance meeting between the servant and this woman. Um, their camels are fed. There's an amazing revelation, a dinnertime speech, a hurried conversation, a crucial question that's asked, a decisive answer that's made, a reluctant decision, a long journey, a meeting between a beautiful bride and her future husband, a happy wedding, and they live happily ever after. When you read the stories, though on one level the details are unfamiliar to us, even though there's been 38 centuries that have passed between us and them, there's something here that we understand. 
We all know about love. We all know about longing. We all know about loneliness. We know about waiting for the right man or the right woman. We know about love at first sight, even if we've never experienced it. Over the course of this past year, a lot of us have been to a lot of weddings. And as I thought about it, it occurred to me that although our customs are different, the passing of all of these years have not changed. The basic things of God bringing a man and a woman together in marriage for his glory, for his honor, has not changed at all. The story of Genesis 24 begins with Abraham. He's old, he's advanced in age, his wife Sarah has died. He's now trying to figure out how his family name continues. He remembers that God has promised him, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, I will bless your children, your nations will multiply across the ends of the earth. The problem is his son Isaac, the promised child, is not married. And in order to be a great nation, you need to have children and grandchildren. And so Abraham is concerned that the name will not continue on. So he calls his servant and he gives him two specific instructions. Number one, you need to go back to the land where we come from and you need to find Isaac a bride. She cannot be from the people of the Canaanites. The bride must be from our own people. Abraham understood it was a tragic mistake to marry someone who wasn't a follower of Jesus. The first principle for you guys who aren't married that you need to understand, regardless of how God brings you a spouse, is that you need to find someone that loves Jesus. And let me encourage you. Find someone that loves Jesus more than you do. Find, Jesus that's, find someone that loves Jesus more than they love you. Find someone that will be willing to follow Jesus even if you will not follow Jesus with them. May their devotion be for Jesus and Jesus alone. Look for someone that loves Jesus. So he looks into the future. He knows his son needs a godly wife. He needs a woman that had been raised with the people of God. So he says to his servant, I want you to go back to my people. Find someone that knows God. Find someone that loves God. And get that, and bring that woman back to marry my son. Listen, it's important that as you look to your future, as you look to who you can marry, that you find someone that loves God. I've counseled folks who are people from two different faith backgrounds. It's a mess. It's a nightmare. They fall in love, but they don't consider their future, especially when they have children, of how they're going to raise their children. It's a disaster. Find someone who will help you pursue the goals and the dreams that God has given you. So the servant listens to Abraham. He says, immediately ask the question, okay, I'll do everything you tell me. I'll go back to the land. I'll look for a wife. What if I don't find someone? Or what if I find someone and she's not willing to come? Great question. What if I do everything God tells me to do and things don't turn out the way I'm supposed to turn out? What if I'm following God, I'm seeking God, I'm obeying God, I'm doing the things God tells me I'm supposed to do and things fail? Abraham says, you know what? Don't worry about it. If you were obedient to God and things don't work out, just come on back. We'll figure something else out. Two it's a very important principle, isn't it? Many times we start something, we do something, believing that we're doing the will of God, and then things don't work out the way we thought it would. And oftentimes, we think that maybe we miss God's will. Trouble necessarily isn't a sign that you miss God's will. Some of you will get into relationships, and you'll face hardships or difficulties in your relationships. Some of you guys that are married are facing difficulties and hardships in your marriage. Trouble isn't a sign that you're out of the will of God. Sometimes trouble is for much bigger purposes, for God to glorify, be glorified in and through your marriage, to be glorified in and through your life. Oftentimes what we want to do is we take and look at trouble and we say, wait a minute, why is trouble happening and I'm trying to obey God? And we say it's not God's will. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes trouble is exactly what God wants in your life so that he could purify you, make you into what he wants you to be. What do you do when you, it doesn't work out the way you thought it would? Not just take it, don't just take it in terms of, who you're supposed to marry, but what about your job? You take this job thinking that this is where God wants you to be and it doesn't work out. You make an investment, it doesn't work out. You enter into a relationship, it doesn't work out. You start school and it doesn't work out. You work hard to get a job and it doesn't work out. You marry a person, it doesn't work out. You make a big decision, it doesn't work out. You start a church and it doesn't go the way you dreamed or you thought. What do you do then? Our first reaction often is to say, well, maybe I was wrong, maybe this wasn't God's will. But I don't think that's the right answer. Trouble is not a sign that you're out of God's will. But maybe it's exactly, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. 
Sometimes God sends trouble not as judgment, but as a sign that you're doing exactly what he wants you to do. I encourage you. Oftentimes we face hardships, difficulties, and we think that maybe God's not in it. God's there. If you are following God, if you are obeying God, if you are trusting God, you can trust that no matter where you're at, what you're going through, what difficulties you're going through, he's right there with you. If you're saying, God, I just want to live my life for you. I want to be obedient for you. You can trust him no matter where he takes you. See, the perspective helps us understand Abraham's instructions to, his to the servant. He says, listen, I believe God is orchestrating the details of this. But if, he doesn't find, if you don't find someone, just come on back. We'll, t we'll take care of it later. So the servant sets out on a long journey. He travels for about a month to get back to this place that Abraham tells him to go. And he gets to the city, gets to the wells of the city. The first thing that he does is he stops. He prays. He says, God, help. Another principle that I need you to understand. As you look for your spouse, as you look to make the right decision, it needs to be grounded in dependence and prayer and trust in Jesus. It begins there. It doesn't begin, oh God, I found this person. Will you help me to marry her? It begins, God, help me to make the right decisions in all of life. Oftentimes, we already know the decision that we want, and then we want God to bless it. That is not how God works. It begins with, God, you have given everything to me. My life is now yours. Every decision I make is yours. You lead me. You guide me. You show me. And if this is not yours, help me to trust that you know what's better for me than I do. It begins in a life that's saturated in prayer. You don't pray just before the big decisions. You begin your life saturated in prayer. You need to be consumed with absolute dependence and trust in Jesus. That's where it starts. So he gets there, and he seeks God's guidance. And he says, God, he even gives God a test. He says, God, here's how I want, uh, here's how I want you to show me your will. I want a girl to come. I'm going to ask her for water. And when I ask her for water, I want her to feed my camels as well. Here's the point. He got to the place where the eligible women were. He prayed. He didn't get out his notepad and say, oh, that woman looks good. He didn't hold a beauty contest by the wells of how the women carried their water jars or how they were able to balance their life and balance these jugs of water they were carrying. He said, God, show me what you want. Oftentimes, we've got our criteria, and we ask God to bless our criteria. That's not how God works. We drop it all at his feet and say, God, show me what you want. So the women approach the well. He's praying, God, which one is it? And I love the way verse 15 talks about in the passage. He says, before he finished praying, before his words were done, God answered his prayer. Rebecca comes out with a jar on her shoulders. He can't even finish his prayer before God is already answering him. See, that's the way God works. When you are trusting him, when you are being obedient to him, God will answer your prayers even before you even know where to turn. It's often when we are trying to figure things out on our own that we make life a mess. It's often when we're trying to do things on our own and then asking God to bless us, that's when disaster happens. But when our faith is absolutely in Jesus, God begins to open doors that only he can open. So Isaiah 65 says, Before you call, I will answer. While you're still speaking, I will hear. Before the servant finishes praying, here comes the young ladies, and Rebecca's leading the way. And he still doesn't know for sure, does he? He doesn't know if she's the one. He does, she does everything she's supposed to, but she doesn't, the servant doesn't know if, the guy is, if Rebecca's going to follow him, if Rebecca's going to come. He doesn't know any of that. I know, just because God answers one prayer doesn't mean that that is God's will for your life. Sometimes, he might show you one thing and it might be a totally different direction. Don't base your life on one sign or one thing. Trust God for every moment, for every step, for every direction. He still needed confirmation. There's still a lot more things that needed to be done. One answered prayer doesn't mean that we see the big picture. Rebecca seems like the right girl. She does everything she's supposed to do, but he still doesn't know. And the servant knows that he has to take the next step in trusting God. Every step is a trust in God. 
So the servant stops to give thanks to God for his remarkable leading so far. What does he do? He stops and worships God. A life of worship is a life that says, God, you're in control of my life. You are the one who orchestrates the details of my life. He says, God, you guided my, my master Abraham. You blessed him. You provided for him. You even guided every step I took. What's he saying? Lord, even before I left Abraham's tent, when I was 500 or so miles away, before I even knew where to go, you knew exactly how to lead me to where I was supposed to be so that I could be specifically where I was so that the right woman can show up at the right time and I was there. That's what he's saying. God, you were working behind the scenes. See, it's a great thing to know that you are doing what God wants you to do. Psalms 37, the steps of a good person are ordered by God. Did the servant know where he was, where he was going, what was going to happen when he left Abraham's house? He did it. Did he plan in advance to meet Rebecca at the well? He did it. Did he know that he was going to ask for the sign of the watering of the camel and a woman was going to answer? He did it. He didn't know what he would find. He didn't know if he was going to find the right girl or not. The only thing he knew was that God was guiding his steps day in and day out. And the same God that led his master before was the same God that was leading his servant right now. It is God that was guiding every step of the way. And God did exactly what the servant prayed for. The rest of the chapter, we don't have time to dive into it, but it's the story of Rebecca, how she introduces um, the servant to Laban and, the, and her father. And they have this great dinner at their house. And the meal is served, and the servant stands up, and he begins this great speech. And in it, he talks about how God has led him to this family. How he talks about how rich Abraham is. Makes Abraham look good. He talks about how Isaac is now the inherit. He's going to inherit all of this riches from Abraham. Makes the guy look good. And he talks about how Isaac was born as a miracle. Repeats Abraham's instructions of how they want a godly wife. And talks about how God reveals step by step, every step of the way, Every sentence reveals his faith in God who led him to Rebecca. Verse 49 is the clincher. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if it's not God's will, tell me that I may know which way to turn. He's a good salesperson, like a car sales guy. He presses for a decision. Make a decision right now. Laban and his father can't say anything when they hear this, and they say, this has to be God. This is God's working. This is God's doing. Here's another point for you to understand. When you are following God's will, you're not the only one that's going to know it. There will be other people in your life that will also confirm it. If you're the only one that sees it and other people in your life don't see it, you need to re-examine it. There will be other people, your church members, your family members, that will also know when you're doing God's will, and they will be there to confirm it. There will be people in your life, godly people, that will be able to pour into you and say, man, we see God working. We see God moving. We see God blessing. You need people in your life to be able to confirm it. Single people, you guys try to do this all by yourself. Get advice and counsel from people that are over you. Pour, let them pour into you. Let them get their godly input into your life. Don't do this by yourself. This is a major decision that you make. Get godly counsel. So they give their consent. They're not excited. They're not happy about her leaving right away, but they give their consent. Now they are like, let's her wait here for a little bit. But the servant says, no, we need, to, we need to go now. We need to leave now. We need to get back to the city. So they say, wait, well, let's just talk to the girl. Let's see what Rebecca says. Let's see if she's willing to do it. Now think about the implications of them asking the girl. Rebecca's never met Isaac. Doesn't know what she looks like. Doesn't know if he's a deadbeat. Doesn't know anything about this guy. Doesn't know if he's mean, if he's cruel, if he's good looking. Doesn't know any of this. All she knows is he's gonna be rich, which is a nice thing to know. Um, but that's all that she knows. She's not being asked, will you go with Isaac? She's being asked, will you go with the servant? That means she's leaving her family forever. Never going to be able to see him. She's never met the servant until about earlier in the day. And now on the basis of one evening and one dinner, she's now being asked to make a decision that will completely change her life forever. 
to go to a place that she's never been, marry a man that she's never met. Will you go with this man? All of us in this room most likely would say no. But because God was leading, because God was working, she immediately responds, says, I will go. Here we see the faith of this woman at work. When God is at work, you will see answers that only God can provide. Not things that you can make up, not things that you can do, that only God can do. So they leave. They go on a journey all the way back to where Abraham was, back to where Isaac was. They arrive, and Isaac is working in the fields. And as soon as Rebekah sees him in the distance, she jumps off the camel, covers her face. The servant tells Isaac who this woman is. Isaac takes her, brings her into the tent. Basically, they get married. And the Bible says that after he marries her, they lo he loves her. Here's a concept for you to understand. Most of you are looking to fall in love with someone. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that you marry someone because you're in love with them. The Bible teaches you marry someone because you see that God is working in that purpose and together you will do more for God together than you would do individually. He marries her, then he loves her. When you marry someone because you want God honored and glorified, love comes after. And you don't fall into love and out of love, but when you are doing God's will together in your life, the love that you have on the day of your marriage is like a seed that will flourish over time and become a fl beautiful flower. Most of us think that marriage day is the apex of how much we love. It's just the beginning. When you are following God, when you are obeying God, when you're doing God's will for your life, your love comes after. Guys, let me speak to you for a second. Nowhere in the Bible, married, married guys or single guys, nowhere in the Bible does the, the Bible teach for a wife to love her husband. Nowhere. It's not in there. But numerous times in Scripture, it teaches husbands love your wife. You are called to love your wife. How? The way Christ loved the church. You men who are single, you are called to model Christ's love for the bride to women around you. Not because they're pretty, not because they look good, not because you want to marry them, but because she is their sister in Christ. And if God brings the two of you together, it's not because she was pretty, it's not because she looked good, it's because the two of you together can accomplish greater things for God than you can individually. That is the biblical definition of what marriage is supposed to look like. Any other reason for you to get married is not God's different definition for marriage. If you're looking to get married so that you can alleviate your loneliness, that's not the biblical definition. If you're looking to get married because you um, hate being alone or you need someone else to help pay your bills, that is not the biblical definition of marriage. If you're looking for someone to get married so that she can make you chaya, Jonathan, that is not the biblical definition <laughs> of marriage. The biblical definition of marriage is that the two of you come together so that together you can bring God glory, honor through your life. Make sense? That is how you are called to live your life. Let me wrap up and give you a couple conclusions here. The overriding truth of the story in Genesis 24 is this. Abraham did everything he was supposed to do. The servant did everything that he was supposed to do. The family members responded and said, this is exactly what God wants. Rebecca said, I see God leading and this is what I'm supposed to do. Isaac said, this is God's leading. She is going to be my wife. They get married. They live happily ever after, have kids, and their kids have a million kids, and they become an entire nation that the world is still talking about. God's plan has worked out. All of these individuals did exactly what they were supposed to do, but behind all of that was Almighty God working. God never speaks in the chapter God, you never see his face in the chapter. You never hear him talking in the chapter. But behind every action, behind every scene, behind every detail was a God that was working on their behalf. And if he was faithful to do it for Isaac and Rebekah, he is faithful to do it for you as well. He is the one that orchestrates the details of your life. 
He's the one that allows you to be exactly at the right place at the right time so you can meet the right person so that through your life together, you can bring glory and honor to God. It is a God thing, always is a God thing. We screw it up when we take God out of the equation. This is God's work. He is faithful to do it. It is God who did the choosing. He is the divine matchmaker who orchestrated the details so that the right man and the right woman could come together at precisely the right moment. One guy said it this way, it's a wonderful thing to know that you're in the will of God. You can even step out into darkness if you know it is God who's leading you. You can walk out knowing that you're following God and you can do whatever God's calling you to do because you know it's him that's going before you. See, the story teaches us some very important things about marriage for you single folks. Number one, the best way to prepare for marriage is to become the best person now. Be the best now. Do what you can now. Get your finances in order now. Work on your sin issues now. Tackle those areas in your life that are not under control now. Be the best person that you can be now. If you look at Rebecca's life, you see six things about her. She was kind. She was industrious. She was hardworking. She was godly. She was resourceful. She was pure. She was decisive. All of this before she got married. Work at being what God has called you to be now. If you're interested in getting married, do what Rebecca did. Cultivate qualities of God in your life as a single person. Number two, if you're interested in getting married, focus less on your future marriage and more on your present faithfulness. Focus on where God is calling you to today. Too often, and I will admit a lot of us have screwed up on this, we're too busy trying to find the right person that we don't do anything for God today. Oh, when am I going to find the right person? I got to get everything in order. I got to look for her. I'm too. And you never accomplish and enjoy where, God, where you're at today. You single folks, now is a time for you guys to do more things for God than ever, than you will when you're married. It gets harder when you're married. It gets extremely difficult when you have children. Enjoy and do what you can for God now. Serve. Go on mission trips. Serve the kids at Camelot. Do something while you're able to do it. Be resourceful, be faithful now. Number three, remember if God wants you to be married, he will bring you the right person at the right time so you don't have to worry about it. If God wants you to be married, he will bring the right person into your life exactly at the right moment. He will. He will. Jason shared his story last week. Mine is very similar. One girl after another, proposal after proposal, dating after dating, nothing working out. Finally came to a point where I said, God, I don't want to get married. I'm tired of looking. And all of a sudden, the two weeks after I say that, God brings my wife into my picture. When I finally gave up and said, God, I'm just going to serve you. I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do now. God brings the right person. We're too busy trying to find the right person that we miss out where we're at right now. Do what God is telling you to do now let him take care of the details of your future. Let me give you a couple of things about guidance as well. Number one, knowing God's will involves forethought, planning, pre preparation, and prayer. Some of you guys are the other end of the spectrum. You don't do anything. You don't look for a spouse. You think God will just magically drop her off um, right in front of you somehow. That's not what Abraham did. He actually had to do some stuff to find the person. There was some action that needed to take place on his end. There's some stuff that you need to do as well. If you hide in your room and play video games all day, you're not going to find someone. Okay, maybe in our culture you might because your parents will find someone for you. But you need to do stuff on your end. There are things that you're called to do. Do it. Be resourceful with the things that you are called to do. Second, when you are faithful, God will guide you. He will. He takes responsibility to guide you. When you put him first, I will make sure that you, when he's, 
when you put him first, when you seek first his kingdom and righteousness, he says, I will take care of all the other details of your life. Seek him first. Number three, because God's in control, relax. Relax. He'll bring you the right person. Don't get anxious. Don't get worried. At his time, in his perfect time, he'll bring you the right person. He's faithful to do it. He's in charge. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's a God who takes care of the details of our lives. He goes before us. He guides us. His Spirit lives inside of us to help us make the right decision. And the only reason the Spirit lives inside of us, as you can come up, is because 2,000 years ago, while we were yet sinners, God left the throne room of heaven. He left all of the riches of glory of heaven, came to this earth, lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we should have died, and suffered anguish on the cross. And because he did that, he now goes to heaven and he now sends the Holy Spirit inside of us so that he could guide us and lead us for every step that we take. He doesn't just leave us to ourselves and say, hey, go make whatever decision you want to make. He says, you know what? I'm going to come live inside of you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you. Whether that's in business, whether that's in marriage, whether that's in parenting, I don't leave you to yourself. Every week we come to the table to remind ourselves that we're not here because of our goodness. We're not here because of how smart we were. We're here because in God's grace and God's mercy, he saved us. And he doesn't just save us and wait for us to get to heaven, but he helps us so that every decision we make, every choice that we make, is guided by him. So we come this morning to the table and we say, God, thank you. Thank you that you don't leave us on our own. Thank you that you don't leave us to make a mess of our lives. But because Jesus died, you help us. Because Jesus died, you transform us. Because Jesus died, you make us a better man, a better woman, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent because of Jesus. Everything that we have, everything that we do is because of Jesus. So this morning I invite you to examine your life. Are you trusting in yourself too much? Is your faith, your confidence in, in yourself? Or is it in Jesus? Is your faith grounded in dependence on God? Is your life grounded in worship of God? Is every decision that you make based on what you want or is it based on God what brings you most glory he gave his life for you and because he did you no longer have a life that you get to live I have been crucified with Christ now every decision I make is not my decision it is about God what brings you glory. So as you come to the table, would you examine your heart, your affections, your desires, your motives from the week? And if there's anything inside of you that wasn't from God, would you repent? Would you confess? I invite you to come grab the elements when you're ready and we'll partake of it together.